Um, obviously, Go is successful. I mean, look at this room, look at what's going on here. Um, and a lot of people have asked why Go is successful or have asked me why Go is successful. And a lot of people have answers that involve tooling or the language or things about it. But I think those are all sort of superficial reasons. I think the real reason is simplicity. Um, Go is simple, at least compared to a lot of other languages that are running around at the moment. And so, but simplicity is actually a complicated subject and there are many ways to think about it. Um, last year, about May, I think, I went to a conference hosted by Microsoft called Lang.next. And I saw a number of actually quite interesting talks, many of which were the leaders of a particular language talking about a new version that was coming out, like JavaScript, uh, PHP, C Sharp, and so on. And I really was struck by one thing about these talks and these languages, which is most of the talks consisted of features being added by taking something from another language and adding it to this one. So, you know, JavaScript's getting classes and that kind of thing. And I realized that what's happening is all of these languages are turning into the same language. Um, there's a concept called language relativity in linguistics, which is also colloquially called the Sapir-Whorf uh, hypothesis, although neither Sapir nor Whorf quite uh, agreed with it. And the idea is basically that language influences thought and the, the sort of cartoon version is, you know, if you speak French, you're, you're, you're more amorous. Um, and it's pretty obviously controversial. Uh, there's some evidence that there may be some truth to it, but not very much. But I think it's really obvious, if you think about it, that um, computer languages, this very much applies. If you're in a logic programming language, you write a very different kind of program, you think a different way than if you're using an object-oriented programming language or a concurrent one. It's very much like disciplines in mathematics. You don't solve calculus using linear algebra, even though they have some structural comparisons. Um, and so I'm worried about this trend in the languages because if they all converge to the same language, we're all gonna be thinking the same way. And that would make life very, very uninteresting. You want to have different languages for different problems. You want to have different domains be solved by different ways of thinking and different notations. In other words, you kind of want a tool that's optimized for each particular way you're working. Now, these talks at Lang.next were about things like Java 8, ECMAScript 6, uh, which has been a long time coming, C Sharp, C++14, and there are a few others that didn't quite fit this mold, but, but let's just talk about the ones that do. Um, as I said, these languages are evolving by adding features. That means they're becoming more complicated. Their complexity is growing while they are simultaneously becoming more similar to one another. And that's a very strange situation for a field to be in. Um, I would summarize that as bloat without distinction. Um, Go, however, as I hope you appreciate, isn't like that. Go is a different language in this respect. Um, it doesn't try to be like these other languages because it's not taking features. It doesn't try to compete by saying, ooh, if they have that feature, we better have it or people will be uh, unwilling to use our language. In fact, as of Go 1, which is, what, three years old now, the language is fixed. You know, you may have noticed that the features that have gone in since then are absolutely tiny. There's really been no significant change to the language since, since Go 1, and that was the point of Go 1. However, many newcomers to Go start by asking, can we add this feature to the language? Can we make error handling different? Can we change the way arrays work or something like that? Um, but the language is fixed. Those things don't get to go in. But it's not just that the language is fixed, it's because adding features will not really make Go better. Um, and why is that true? It would just make it bigger, but it would make it less different. And both of those are worse, in my opinion. Um, but obviously you need features. You can't have a programming language without some features in it, but which ones? Well, obviously the right ones. And so we picked the right ones. How did we pick the right ones? Well, one way is that the original language was designed by Ken Thompson, Robert Griesemer, and myself. And we all have very different backgrounds. Ken and I had worked together at Bell Labs quite a bit, but we also had done very different things, and you know, Ken is a god. Um, so when we came to talk about what was going into the language, we insisted that all three of us not only agreed with the feature going in, but agreed that it was the right feature to go in. And with our different backgrounds and our different perspectives, that dramatically narrowed the number of things that went into Go. Um, but you still have to pick what to put in. And our overriding thing for doing this was readability. Uh, and here's how we think about this. If a language has too many features, or even more than you, know, you might need, um, you spend time programming thinking about which features to use. 
If there's really a lot of features, you may look at a line of code, write it one way, ooh, I could do something different, I could use this feature, I use that feature. You might even spend you know, half an hour playing with a few lines of code to, to find all the right ways you could use different features to make the code work a certain way. And it's kind of a waste of time to do that. But worse, when you come back to the program later, you have to recreate that thought process. You not only have to understand this complicated program, programming language doing whatever it's doing, you have to understand why the programmer, who might be you, decided that this was the way to approach the problem from the feature set available. Um, and that is just, I think, bad engineering. The summary, summarization of this is the code is harder to understand simply because it is using a more complex language. You want to have just one way, or at least fewer, simpler, easier to understand ways. So in other words, features add complexity, we want simplicity. Features hurt readability, we really want readability. And readability is, by my opinion, the most important feature of a programming language. Because readable means reliable. If you can read the code and know what it means, then you can, it's easier to understand, it's easier to work on, it's easier to extend, it's easier to fix when it breaks, it's easier to understand why it's broken. These are all good things, and that is why readability is so important. If the language is complicated, on the other hand, you have to understand more to understand even where to start working on the program. And you have to understand a more complicated model in which the program is being written. These cost time and are make the language harder to use. But there's a trade-off. Obviously, making more features in a language gives you more fun things to play with. And so there's a fundamental trade-off in Go that was made in a different direction from most other languages. And the trade-off is, what do you want? A language that's more fun to write in or easier to work on and maintain? And for the most part, the decisions in Go about what went in were about long-term maintenance, and in particular in the context of large-scale programming, although that's a little off the topic today. Now, the thing is, you put features in to make languages expressive. You obviously want to not have to type you know, hexadecimal numbers, which would be a very uh, low-feature way to write code, but obviously very hard to use. But you have to be careful, because if you make something too concise, it can become just unreadable. Um, this example here is a real working program in a, a dialect of APL called Dialog, and it implements Conway's Game of Life. And I think you could argue that even if you're an expert APL programmer, it's not very readable. APL is famous for being easy to write and hard to read. But, and I think it's very, we have to be very careful we don't write software like this in a modern, distributed, multi-programmer, you know, open source world. Um, but there's a more important point, I think, well, maybe, maybe an equally important point, which is when you have features that add expressiveness, they typically add expense. For instance, a lot of people have asked for things like map and filter to be built into Go, and we've said no. One of the reasons we've said no is that if you, if you have things like map and filter, well, they're going to use them. That's why they're there. But they may be more expensive than a simple for loop. And when the features are there to make life easier and more expressive, they tend to generate more expensive, in terms of computer time, solutions to problems that have much simpler solutions. So they're also, they may help the programmer, although not always, but they'll almost always hurt the computer unless the implementation is extremely smart. And believe me, the implementation of APL is extremely smart, so that actually is a modestly efficient implementation of uh, the game of life, but you wouldn't, you could do much, much better if you wrote a simpler program. But you've got to be careful, because if you make everything too expensive and explain everything in detail, you get a very verbose language, I won't name any, but you know the ones I'm thinking of, where it just seems like you're writing too much to say a simple thing. So you have to balance this. So what we did was we tried to make the right selection building on the ideas that were familiar so that a programmer with a background in procedural programming, like with C or Java or even you know, Fortran, say, could read a Go program and get a pretty good idea right out of the box what was happening and not be confused by strange notation. So you have to balance. You have to be concise, but be expressive. Make sure that the program's easy to read. You have to pick the right set of features, in other words. Not just features for features' sake. The way I like to think of this is to think of the entire world of programming as a vector space of very high dimension. And what you want to do is to find the basis set that covers that vector space so that you can write the programs you want by combining the appropriate orthogonal because that's what a basis it is, orthogonal set of features. Um, and what happens when you add features for expressiveness or for fun is it tends to add more non-basis vectors into that space, and so there become many paths to get to a particular solution. 
So that's when we say features are orthogonal, that's what we mean. We mean that they cover this space, but we also mean they interact really well. So if you take feature A and feature B and you write a program that uses them, they ex work exactly the way you expect feature A and feature B to work. They're not in some weird diagonal that causes all kinds of complications you have to worry about. Again, I won't mention which language I'm thinking of. So you have to keep all of this in mind when you're designing a language. And also think about what the goal is. What are you actually trying to achieve? What is the problem domain that this language is being done for? Well, in Go's case, we are trying to write code for Google because that's what we do. Uh, in Go's software, at least the parts that we worked on, are mostly infrastructure, server infrastructure, what we now call cloud software, but used to just be called servers. Um, and to do this, you have to find enough pieces to build the software. And so the fundamental components we, we started with were ideas like concrete data types, you know, integers, structures, floating point numbers, functions and methods, interfaces, packages, concurrency, and then the sort of guiding engineering principle of having a really good, fast implementation with the ability to have really good tooling. And with that sort of all, with all those guidelines, which is a fairly complicated set of considerations, the pieces sort of fell into place and actually ended up being kind of simple in practice. And in fact, simplicity can be expressive. This is a very simple drawing. Rene drew this uh, a while back. And yet he's expressive, right? He's not really a gopher. And I'm not talking about the Magritte version of Sassine Pas un gopher. I mean, he's just the representation of a gopher, very much like, like Shreve's talk earlier with the horse, right? And so this for me is what is, is part of like the ethos of Go. Here's this really simple drawing that represents what Go is like. We could put more features on it. We could make it more like a gopher. We could give them lots more detail. And we get something like this, right? <laughs> but mostly what we've added is ugliness and hair. We haven't actually made him better, right? It's complexity without clarity. So, but I want to make a really important point here, which is I've said Go is simple, but it's not. It's very complicated. I know, I worked on it. It's one of the most complicated things I've ever worked on. Um, and yet it feels simple. And I think that's a really important idea. Um, and it feels simple because these pieces fit together orthogonally. And that requires a lot of design, a lot of thinking, a lot of refinement and implementation and re-implementation. And to put it very bluntly, simplicity, at least in this context, is the art of hiding complexity. So let me talk about a few simple things in Go and why they're really complicated. Um, Garbage collection, go routines, constants, interface, and packages. Each of these things is very simple and very complicated by, at the same time. There's a lot of other subjects I could pick, but let's quickly go through these. Garbage collection is probably the best example of simplicity hiding complexity. What is the programmer interface for garbage collection? There isn't one. Can't get simpler than that. The empty set is as simple as it gets, right? And yet, look how hard it is to implement all that incredible code to deal with stack maps and you know, the copying the stacks on, uh, when you need to grow them and tracking all the references down, pausing it, running in parallel with the, with the mutator. It's a tremendously complicated problem that fortunately I didn't have to work on. We have some really good people in the Go team who did. Um, but I think it's amazing to consider how much code is there for something that has absolutely no user interface. There isn't even a free function in Go. There's nothing but garbage collection to manage memory and it, it's remarkable to point out that it isn't even in the spec. The Go language does not define that it is garbage collected in the specification. The only mention is in the introduction was a throw, throwaway property of a feature of the language. That's how small and therefore how simple the spec is. I mean, the, the garbage collection is. And yet how complicated it is behind the scenes. And it also makes the code simpler because you don't have to think about who owns the data, who's going to free it, how to manage it for you. you can, Think about implementation details and efficiency, but for just straightforward Go programming, garbage collection hides everything. It's fantastic. Uh, and one of the things that people love about Go is the concurrency. I think it's arguably one of the simplest concurrency models available in a programming language. Not that there are that many, but there are some others. Um, there's several components to it, Go routines, channels, and select. And I'm gonna talk about Go routines for a minute. You start a Go routine with the Go keyword. You say Go space, G-O space, and then the function call. So three keystrokes. You can't make it much shorter than that. I can imagine one or two changes I could make. But um, three keystrokes, and you've just started a subprocess in the general mathematical term. And so it's like garbage collection because it's an extremely simple UI. There's nothing in the UI about the size of the stack or a thread ID or managing um, go routines, shut them down, things like that. 
Uh, there's, there's no uh, completion status, there's no type. A lot of people ask for these things, and in fact, some other languages prov or, or um, thread packages provide the equivalent functionality of some of those things, but we didn't put them in. We wanted the Go keyword to be so simple that it had the minimum possible UI. Here's a function call, run it alongside my other things. Three keystrokes. Um, and that's part of this minimal design. And in Krashla's talk earlier today, he talked about one of the reasons I think you can appreciate now why, for instance, there's no ID on a Go routine. Internally, of course, you have a lot of complexity. Managing this, managing the relationship between the Go routine implementation, the runtime stack, and the garbage collector, for example. Incredibly complicated behind the scenes stuff. But three keystrokes. Constants. This is one of my favorite things about Go that most people don't even think about. And they don't think about it because it's incredibly simple. When we decided that Go had to be strictly typed, that meant that numeric types could not be interchanged freely. That was a very common source of bugs in C and C++. You were not allowed in Go to take an int and put it into a float64 or anything like that. But that can be very clumsy. You don't want to have to say float64 zero every time you want to use a floating point zero. So we had this idea, which is one of Go's, I think, relatively novel ideas, which is that we made constants just be numbers. They're just numbers, even though the language is strictly typed. And this means you get to throw around things like 1e9 dividing into a time.second, which has a strict type. And to get this to work was really hard. It was one of the hardest things in designing language, not in implementing it so much, but designing it. We had to worry about what infinite precision integers mean what infinite precision floating point means, what happens to the promotion rules if you divide an integer to versus divide a floating point to. Um, and you get corner cases like this crazy shift, which I can't run, but uh, what do you think the answer is to this? What does this program print? It's got a 2.0 and a 2.0 shifted zero and asking the type of both of them. You have to think, don't you? This is a place where the complexity comes out. You, get an, you actually get a float 64 and an int. And that's not a good thing. It's just a consequence of the rules that we eventually converged on to make constants work right. But for the most part, you never see these kind of warts when you're using constants. They just feel like numbers, and it's fantastic. So I'm not totally satisfied, but I think it was a really good example, again, of simplicity hiding complexity. And I wrote a blog post uh, called on blog.golang.org slash constants that talks about this stuff in much more detail. Um, Interfaces, one of Go's favorite features for myself and I think for a lot of Go programmers. A very simple idea, all there is is a set of methods. People ask for data as well all the time, not gonna get it, it's just, it's just functions. Very simple, you also need a variable uh, of type interface so you can program with these things. But even here you get some funny things happening because you, for instance, can assign os.stud into a reader, no problem. You can assign os.stud into an empty interface, no problem. But if you have to narrow the interface, um, you have to do a dynamic type check, which we call the type assertion. And one of the things that's not well known about Go is that was not in the original design. We realized a few months into it that we needed type assertions to make the program work right. The addition of effectively dynamic typing into a statically programmed language was a com complicated thing that we had to deal with um, and make it work. And it's, I'm not totally thrilled with how it worked out, but I think it's pretty good, and it does, uh, in the end, do its job. But for the most part, what you have, again, is a very simple idea. An interface is a set of methods. And with, again, a quite complicated set of rules behind them that mostly just do what you want. But it was hard. In fact, interfaces are probably Go's most distinctive and powerful feature. I, I think concurrency is talked about a little more but you don't write as much concurrency in a typical program as you, as you use interfaces. Interfaces have a profound effect on the library. Um, they've enabled the very structure of Go programs to be the way they are with, a, I think, the most component-oriented architecture of any programming language I've used. Um, and so they, in fact, I think can safely say they are simple to use. Even though they add complexity, they're worth it. And finally, uh, packages. Packages are um, one of the hardest things we had to deal with in design a language. It doesn't seem like there's anything there. What do you have? You have package big, there's the name of the package. You have an import string in the client. Blah. What's there? It took us months to figure this out because it interacts with things like scoping, naming, information hiding, isolation, linking, compiling, uh, cross-compiling, and getting all those details right took a very, very long time. Um, and, but on the other hand, 
you guys never think about this stuff, right? They just work. Somebody earlier today said import was his favorite keyword. That's great. I love it. Um, and all that complexity, which is fantastically intricate when you start talking about working across multiple, uh, multiple implementations of, you know, for different architectures and different operating systems, it's all hidden behind this simple package idea that has basically two concepts. And that includes the things like go get, which is a fantastic enabler for open source based on the fact that the import uh, string is literally that, a string with no semantic meaning within the language. So again, very hard to implement, very complicated under the covers, extremely simple to use. And I think after garbage collection, packages are actually the most, uh, the best example of simplicity hiding complexity. So let me show you, here's a simple example. Um, it's just the, the sort of standard hello world server. It's written with some Japanese in it because why not? Um, but you all I think can recognize as competent Go programmers very quickly what that program does. I don't need to run it. It does run. It does what you think. Very simple, right? There's hardly anything there. It's just a few lines of code. Starts a server, runs it. Okay, here's what's going on inside this program. Uh, first of all, most visibly, it's doing Unicode and UTF-8, working flawlessly. Um, it's importing some magic packages and they're being used. Fump, log, net HTTP, net HTTP being one of the most awesome packages. Um, there's an fprintf directly to a network connection, which is interesting and unusual. Um, there's a function being promoted to a method with the handle func in there, uh, which is uh, a bit of a mind blow to people new to Go. It was mind blow to me when it was pointed out to me by Russ that we could do that. Um, it's also truly concurrent. The server won't block. As long as there's enough resources on the server hardware, you can have zillions of people talking to this service simultaneously, which is to say it's production ready. There it is, a production ready web server in just a few lines of code. It doesn't get much simpler than that, right? So in summary, um, simplicity is complicated, but the clarity is worth the fight. I don't want to hang out with the gopher on the right. I want to hang out with the guy on the left. He's, he's much more expressive and fun and much less hairy. So in conclusion, simplicity is very hard to design. It's very complicated to build. It sounds strange to say that, but it's true. Making things simple is hard work. But if you get it right, you get something that's very easy to use. And I think the success of Go and the fact that you're all here listening to me proves that there's something there. Thank you.